Colleagues, good afternoon and welcome to this Further Education Trust for Leadership webinar, which focuses on higher education within further education. The webinar will last about an hour, uh, and after about 30 minutes, there will be the opportunity to put questions to the report authors. So please send in your questions uh, as the webinar progresses. For those with social media, the social media address is hashtag FETLWebinar. For those of you that don't know me, my name is Neil Bates and I've been Chief Executive and Principal uh, of the Further Education College and an independent learning provider for the last 30 years. This webinar has been organised by the Further Education Trust for Leadership. FETL is a think tank and its aim is to stimulate thought and debate about the big issues that face the FE sector both now and in the future. One way the FETL stimulates uh, those debates and reflections is through the publication of monographs. Monographs are short, forward-thinking treatments of a subject that is key to the leadership of thinking in further education and skills. Written at the invitation of the Trust, they aim to influence leadership in and out of the sector, taking its present needs and concerns as their starting point, and then looking deeply into the experiences of colleagues in order to devise scripts for the future. Last week, FETL published Higher Education in Further Education, leading the challenge. A monograph presented by the Mixed Economy Group and co-authored by John Widdersome and Madeleine King. Madeleine is a research and international officer for the Mixed Economy Group of Colleges. She's a policymaker by background, having worked for the FEFC, Skills Council and the AOC. She's a particular interest in higher education in FE and has published a number of papers and articles on the subject. Here today to talk about the monograph is its co-author John Willison, CBE. He will need no introduction to many of you, but for those of you who don't know uh, about John's long and distinguished career, uh, here are some highlights. John is a lawyer by training, we won't hold that against him, um, and he's the principal of New College Durham one of the first English colleges to be granted foundation degree awarding powers by the Privy Council. He's the former president of the Association of Colleges and he's the current chair of the AOC HE portfolio group. He's chaired the Mixed Economy Group for many years and he's written and spoken extensively about further and higher education and the opportunity that college-based HE provides as an alternative to traditional approaches to higher education. John, welcome. I'm delighted Thanks, that you've been able to join us all the way from Durham. <laughs> um, uh, the, John, the, the publication of the monogram is very timely. We have a range of reforms of technical education. We have the Level 4-5 review. Of course, we have the uh, development of T-levels um, and the post-16, sorry, post-18 funding review. Mm. Um, so this debate about higher education and its role uh, and the involvement of further education in it is, is, is timely in the context mm. of those wider reforms. So I wondered to start with whether you could just introduce your monogram um, and tell us a little bit about why you've written it and, and what, what the key messages are that are in it. Okay, I think, uh, as you say, it's an interesting time for all aspects of education, particularly in colleges, though it's never been uninteresting, I think, in colleges. I think in terms of higher education, there's a lot of change out there and a lot of questions about what the system's there to do, who it's there to serve, and how you put the best interest of students right at the heart of, of what's on offer. And I think colleges have a, a unique role to play there. Some universities also play in that space, but colleges, I think, have got that localness, they've got the ability to offer access to higher education to people who couldn't otherwise get it, they've got uh, the ability to teach well, and I think also the links with things like apprenticeship programmes, which I see great developments there in terms of high level apprenticeship, and also I think it's a great opportunity to really cement the college and its community, to offer things that other people aren't prepared to offer or aren't able to offer. So I think there's a real potential there for lots of colleges to develop the higher education offer. The monograph brings together current experience. It doesn't say everything in there can be done by every college. It doesn't say that everything in there will work in every college. But you said at the start, FETL is about thinking. 
So what we hope the monograph will do is get people to think about, first of all, whether they offer higher education, and then to think deeply about the way they do it, uh, what sort of offer they put on, and also principally really think about how it's going to change the lives of the students that we've got out there who wouldn't otherwise be engaged in HE. So perhaps if you could um, help us to understand the, the kind of mm -hmm. issues and considerations of, uh, of getting involved in FE by referencing your own college um, in terms of you know, why you decided to get into HE and the kind of things that you had to, to think about before that uh, happened. Well, I've got to say, like, like a lot of colleges, it, it wasn't, I don't think, anybody's conscious decision to go into HE. We, we've been offering higher education since 1921, I think it is. Um, and that's the case of a number of other colleges as well. Lots of mixed economy group members have got nearly 100 years of, of tradition of offering higher education, but it's work-related vocational education outside the university sector. Quite often, not even leading to, to degrees in, the, in the, the way we understand them, but maybe higher-level technical qualifications or professional qualifications. So I think you know, what one of the things in the monograph is to think why you're doing it. Just because we've offered it as a college for that length of time doesn't necessarily mean we should continue to do so in the future. It's got to fit with what we do and it's got to fulfil a need. So I think drifting into higher education is probably the worst thing you can do. Uh, I always think it's, uh, it's too attractive sometimes for, for college principals to think they can get dressed up once or twice a year <laughs> in a nice flowing gown. Not that I really, you know. <laughs> anyway, um, but uh, th that's not what it's about. It's about making sure we offer something other people don't offer and making sure that we allow the people that we serve to actually maximise their potential by getting these high level qualifications. Not least because you know, the economy of the future will need those qualifications as high technical skills. Mm. So when you talk about higher education, mm. what, do you, what do you actually mean? Well, I don't mean honours degrees taught for three years full time away from home to university. Um, I occasionally talk to university colleagues, I say, you know, our HE world, although it's a lot smaller in scale, because although there's about 160,000 students out there studying HE and FE, um, they, they study a variety of programmes. A lot will study for HND, HNC, they'll study for foundation degrees, they'll increasingly study for honours degrees in college, they'll study for high level MVQs, they'll study for professional qualifications above level three. So the variety of HE and FE is actually probably greater than the variety of courses most universities offer. And that means all the demands about how you price it, how you market, how you actually make sure that the teaching methodologies adopted are right for that type of student, that type of qualification, you know, ranging from, from some fairly traditional professional courses, time constrained exams, right the way through to very highly work-based provision. So I think there's a, there's a big challenge there in, from a professional perspective as to how you actually structure it, how you actually teach it. And the monograph attempts to deal with that and give some pointers but I think every college will find its own way through this. Every teacher out there, every leader out there will find their own way through it as well. But hopefully we can learn from each other. So if I go back in my memory 20 years or so uh, ago, mm -hmm. I can remember the local technical college being full of people doing higher education, yep. doing uh, uh, BTEC qualifications and so on. Um, your book talks about, I think it's 159 thousand yeah. off, of, off of about 1.4 million people doing uh, HE and 159,000 in FE. Um, wh why, did, why the decline? Why, is, why did that happen? Well, I think a number of reasons for it. One is, um, inevitably, universities, in my view, have oversold the three-year honours degree. So we now get young people coming out who really question what value that degree has for them. Mm -hmm. And employers questioning what skills are added to those people by going through those courses. And I think that's going to be increasingly the case. You know, we're seeing lots of questions about value for money yeah. for the HE qualification. A lot of students from less well-off backgrounds face not only fees of £9,000, but if they do choose to live away from home, then really probably more than that in living costs. Mm. So getting a degree for people from less well-off backgrounds, widening participation uh, students, they've got a daunting challenge, a daunting financial challenge, and they need to see that what they get is value for money. It's worth that investment because it should be an investment, not an expenditure. So I think we've got the opportunity to actually you know, put that across. I think also we've got the opportunity to say just eight years isn't something that just happens at 18. Mm. Uh, if you change your job, mm. change your career, then you're going to have to acquire additional skills, and there's going to be a college down the road that hopefully can help you to do that.
Mm. So I do think there's lots of opportunity there. It's not going head to head with universities. That that would not be a wise idea. I think in, for, for all sorts of reasons, not least the resource that goes into it. Mm. But it is about making sure we've got more flexible opportunities. And if you look at that 159, 160,000. Uh, group 10% or whatever it is, then you'll see mature students, you'll see students from different backgrounds, you'll see students who are part-time, mm. and part of that decline that you identify is that almost catastrophic decline in part-time higher yeah. education, which had that happen in the full-time market, yes. then that would be on the front page of every newspaper and it would be a national crisis, something mm. would be done. But because that's happened with the part-time student, the part-time market, it's not going unnoticed but it's gone unaddressed. Yeah. And I think, you know, introduction of hiring degree apprenticeships goes some way towards addressing that, but there's still something there that we have lost from the system as it operated in the past, which I think colleges are ideally placed to recover. Mm. So, so you're really describing um, a different group of people, mm -hmm. potentially a different delivery model yep. from full-time uh, honours degrees, um, uh, and a different focus uh, perhaps from many universities, not all, but uh, yeah. many universities. Um, so if there are things that are different uh, about uh, delivery of HE, what are the things that the colleges uh, and the providers of uh, higher education, or those thinking about it, what are the things they've actually got to do that are like HE? Okay. Uh, I mean, clearly, if you're going to offer degree programmes, whether foundation degrees or honours degrees, then there are things to do with the pedagogy, which they don't yeah. call teaching, of course, it's always yes. pedagogy, um, which I can't spell, obviously, but still. Um, but you've also got to think about the updatedness of staff. You've got to think about what sort of HE you're trying to do. And one of the big yeah. debates is around research and scholarship. Yeah. And in fact, there has been a, a project that's been running, uh, funded by HEFKE and operated, managed by the AOC, to look at how different approaches to scholarship can actually work to support HE and FE. Mm. I think you're right in saying also it's not just a college thing, certainly some universities are there, but also training providers yeah. I think increasingly they are going to look yeah. at this and it gives the opportunity for different approaches and different partnerships. But in terms of research and scholarship I think we've got to make the case for, if you like, employer facing scholarship and I think scholarship's the wrong word. Yeah. Uh, it's really about making sure our staff are up to date, that they're credible professionals, if they are teaching part-time students then those students are very challenging. I know from my own teaching experience, um, very long time ago now, more than 20 years ago, since they stopped me doing it. Um, <laughs> but, um, but I do think that it's important that, that our staff are credible professionals because they'll be yeah. teaching not just aspiring professionals, but people actually working out there in those businesses and those industries. Yeah. And it's really, really easy to fall behind. So I think it's important that colleges have that distinctiveness about how we develop our staff and how mm. we make sure they remain up to date. Mm. I have to say, you know, we've probably paid lip service to it too much in the past. Mm. You know, committees and cups of tea and cakes and whatnot. I think now we've got to make a real effort to make sure our staff are credible. Yeah. Uh, and, and that's got all sorts of consequences that the monograph looks at around reward systems, how you recruit them, mm. and then once you've got them, how you keep them up to date. Mm. And of course, turn an industry professional into a good teacher, because our mm. students want to be taught well. Whenever we ask them in surveys, they want those credible professionals, but they want good teachers. Yeah. yeah. And that's, of course, one of the big challenges is, is I think, the, um, this year's um, average salary of a uh, FE uh, yeah. teacher was 32,000. Uh, the average salary of someone working as a senior lecturer within a university was nearer 45 to 55. Yep. Thousand, so it's a big challenge in terms of attracting yep. people into the uh, FE profession, but also attracting people in that have got the skills and the abilities to teach at a higher level. Yeah, how, did, how did you tackle that? Well, I, I wouldn't say we've, we've got it perfected by any means, and it is a mm. challenge because clearly the the, the, the the basis on which we're funding something for our FE provision is inadequate really to, to do what we really need to do. We, we all mm. bravely struggle on, but it needs to change. In HE, we've got more control over pricing and fees, yeah. and you, you will have seen a number of colleges that started off charging a much lower fee are gradually drifting up, getting access yeah. agreements in place, mm. because they need to have that extra resource to make sure that the quality of the course is yep. right. 
It's yeah. not the same as in a university. It's different but equal. It's, it's the same um, levels of quality because we're subject to the same quality regime. Yeah. But I think this employer-facing work, you know, the, the student experience of a part-time student with a full-time job, maybe a family, very different to the experience mm. of a full-time undergraduate living on campus. Yeah. And we need to recognise that. And I think colleges have got the experience and the background to do that. But in terms of the actual teaching staff themselves, I think we do have to think outside the box a little bit. Um, certainly in my own institution, we've got uh, a means by which we can look at market-related supplements, because actually the comparative probably isn't university senior lecturers, mm. it's people working in the parent industry. Okay. And we know that that is really very, you know, it's very volatile and very different at, according to the sector in which people are working. Yeah. Uh, we also, I think, need to have that more open, constructive dialogue with employers to get them to play their part. Mm. And for me, that isn't just um, you know, c coming along to committee meetings. It's about a real engagement that maybe you know, people who are actually working full time for a manufacturing company, if I use the North East as an example, for one day a week, whatever it is, come into the college and instruct and teach. Yeah. Our part in that is to make sure they can teach well and, and possibly also to, to, as far as we can, remove some of the bureaucracy that colleges and the system within which we work mm. insist upon, because mm. I think it's a real problem for lots of people from industry used to just getting on with the job. Yeah. So I think there's a new partnership there, a new dialogue there. Mm -hmm. Can I press you a little bit on the, the issue about setting fees? Mm. Um, because, of course, the FE sector has not been used to setting the price. The price is normally determined by uh, funding bodies. Yeah. And so um, suddenly to, to actually have to price provision um, uh, maybe needs a different set of skills and a different yeah. approach? Yeah, I think, you know, we, we, in the monograph we address this in, in one of the sections. Right. Um, I think what we found when the fees started to go up, and that's some time ago now, they mm. went up from mm. around about £1,100 to 3000 maximum and then up to nine maximum, 9250 I think it is at the moment. Um, and what we found in the college sector, certainly within the mixed economy group, was we're about the only part of the HE landscape that actually did have a differential approach to fees. Yeah. So we found that some colleges tried to stick with as low a fee as they possibly could. Yeah. And other colleges went in, probably not at the level of, of the maximum £9,000, £9,250, but somewhere near that, recognising yeah. resources, maybe paying the staff on a different basis, for the reasons I've said before, um, and also to make sure that things like IT systems were available and of the right to, you know, right size, right calibre. Um, so I do think that pricing was an interesting debate. What we found was that there is very little elasticity, very little impact on demand, whether you charge £6,000 or £8,000 yeah. for full-time students, which okay. is interesting, because I don't yeah. think we thought that would be the case. And that mainly is for students younger uh, in age. Yeah. I think for mature students, a lot of the time for them, they are making a change of career so they can actually see the benefit they want to get. So, for example, we run a, a degree in social work. The people going on that are almost by definition mature. They've got some life experience which they need to bring to that profession. Mm. And they see you know, the three-year degree program that we offer as part of converting themselves from one role in life to yeah. another. So that's yeah. the real investment in their own futures. I think they see the point in that. I think that um, the other distinction I would make is that the part-time student and the part-time student's employer have a different view. Mm. So whereas we didn't find a lot of price sensitivity for full-time students, mm. we certainly did for part-time. Yeah. And you asked about the declining part-time, I think one reason might be that it suddenly became three times as expensive when yeah. it was offered by many universities and some colleges. Mm. So I think we're now looking at two distinctive and different markets, yeah. one for part-time, one for full-time, and there may be a third market there now which is that which is being created by the apprenticeship levy yeah. and hiring degree apprenticeships, where yeah. certainly early experience says some employers are really keen to spend as much levy as they can. So I think people have probably seen in the, the press over the last couple of weeks this discussion about whether MBAs are an appropriate you know, qualification to, to, to use for the apprenticeship levy. But I do think that some employers are trying to get the maximum, so they want a lower fee so they can get more employees through. Mm. I think the interesting thing there will be how we price it, how we, we discuss with employers, when we really have got that, um, the holy grail really of a, a degree apprenticeships, yeah. an alternative route to the full, to the full time three year degree. Yeah. yeah. I'm interested in the, 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 the issue about um, the status of, 
higher education qualifications. Mm. Um, you know, it seems to me that we have this situation where uh, the BA honours degree is the, uh, the, the top of the tree um, and that uh, it has a status attached to it, uh, you have a degree. Um, but actually, if you do a level four qualification or a level five qualification, it, it is seen as a step towards a degree rather than being a professional status in its own right. Do you think that's one of the issues and challenges about um, getting the, uh, the the parity of esteem for yeah. higher level qualifications? I, mean, I, I, I guess the, the question is really what, what's so special about an honours degree really? Yeah. Uh, and that may depend upon why you're studying for it. Hmm. And certainly for a lot of um, you know, reluctant learners, again the widening participation group of learners or those people who are just lacking confidence about their ability to succeed, hmm. Looking at that sort of mountain of a three-year honours degree uh, yeah. can be really too much of a challenge for them. But I do think that coming on to do a level four and then progressing to level five is important. I also think that we've actually lost something in this overselling of the three-year honours degree, and that is um, the value of qualifications like high nationals and foundation degrees latterly. Yeah. And in some professions, uh, things like accounting technicians at level four, where that's the, where people want to aspire to be. Mm. And they can progress later, but again, one of the other things I think we've found in the research we've done within the Mixed Economy Group is that for that type of student, progression quite often isn't linear. Yeah. So you might do a uh, an apprenticeship to level three with a training provider or a college. You might then go back to work and your employer might want you to go back to work. Yeah. And then maybe sometime later, and this is probably I think a feature of th industries like construction, when you decide you don't want to actually practice that trade or profession, but you want to change and maybe become more managerial or maybe yeah. take a professional role, you then need to come back into the qualification system. And that's something that colleges do well, I think, because yeah. we're used to flexibility. We're used to actually people not dropping out, but dropping in. And yeah. then as things yeah. change in their life, they need, we need to be much more flexible about it. Mm. So I do think, although it's only that 10%, as you say, it's a really vital 10%. Mm. And there's a percentage of the 90 who would be probably better served by that approach, yeah. who probably now do an honours degree, who would actually really want the opportunity, say, after two years of full-time study, to, to look at the job market and to mm. see. I think there, that brings in all sorts of issues which we don't really touch on in detail in the monograph, really about how you measure the impact of higher education. Mm and measures of social mobility that depend just on income levels to me seem to be inappropriate and inadequate, certainly for college-based yeah. HE. Because yeah. we're, we're, we're educating people who are going to become classroom assistants, who mm. by definition are going to be working term time only on you know, low levels of pay, mm. but getting lots of job satisfaction, probably being the first person in their family to get any form of higher level qualification, whether it's a foundation degree or a teaching yeah. qualification and having an almost immeasurable impact on the lives of the children that they're working with. Mm. And a lot of college work, because it's vocational in nature, you'll find people from the caring professions. And, yeah. and care is one of those areas that, that does lack those higher level skills in the non-clinical aspects of care. And I think there, there's a great opportunity to professionalise the workforce, make it more effective and efficient, but also bring in a whole cohort of people who in the past wouldn't see themselves as yeah. higher education learners or having higher education qualifications. So there's a, there's a great challenge, but also a great opportunity there. Okay. I want to, before we go to uh, questions from mm. people who uh, joined us in the webinar, um, I just want to take you to the, one of the more tricky issues. Um, uh, and I suppose to, to characterise it, competition or collaboration. Yeah. Um, you know, colleges and independent learning providers looking to go into a space which has been traditionally the domain of uh, universities and actually finding it necessary to have a relationship with the university in order to be able to deliver that yeah. provision. Mm -hmm. So how did you approach that and what, what, what would be your advice to people thinking about uh, moving into HE? Well, I mean, uh, what, what I would say is think about it first, think deeply, look at all the implications and we try and explore some of those in the monograph. Uh, not just from the teaching perspective but from leaders and managers and governors as well. Uh, that, that's the first thing. I think the second thing really is just to, you have to make a decision about collaboration or competition and, and, and that's quite a complex one because you might be collaborating on some issues and competing on others. So yeah. although we've got um, you know, over a thousand higher education learners, we don't offer the full range of HE courses that most universities would do. 
we're pretty yeah. specialised and we, we're certainly vocational and technical in nature. So a lot of our students who study at level three, we will not be able to provide those progression pathways. Although mm. actually we're pr pr providing more and more because our students want to stay. They like what they get. And yeah. they, if they're very vocationally oriented, um, looking at the Commission on the Vocational Adult Learning, they, they yeah. can see themselves that clear line of sight to work. They know what they want to do then they're very attracted by a course that gets them there quickly yeah. and, and gives them the skills that they need. They can see that. They're very demanding for those skills, but if they get them, they're very successful when they go into employment. So I do think that we've got that opportunity to actually collaborate. Yeah. But I think in terms of competition, well, you know, lots of HEIs have pulled out of the part-time market because it seemed to be hard and difficult. We've heard in the press recently the difficulties some of the more Augusta institutions have in attracting people from minority communities and widening participation backgrounds. Colleges do that well. We're in the yep. right place geographically and we're in the right place psychologically, I think, to, to try and, and, and shape our offer to, to a variety of needs. So I, I think, um, yeah, the, the, the one thing I would say around validation is there is still that um, dependency relationship. Yeah. So one of the things we talk about is whether colleges should seek to acquire awarding powers of their own. Yep. And more and more colleges, still a small number, are going down that route. I hope that with the changes after the Higher Education Research Act last year, that route will be made easier. Yeah. More colleges will go down it, but I do think we've got the scope for more partnerships. It's not just university college partnerships, it's college college partnerships. It's college training provider partnerships mm. because many training providers will want to look at this area. And I know from my own institution we're, we're talking with them now, uh, but they don't have any experience of higher education. No. So they're, you know, they're quite rightly reluctant to get involved if they think it's got demands and they've got preconceptions that higher education means university. And it doesn't. Yep. And it shouldn't. So I think there's, there are new partnerships and new collaborations out there as well. But validation will, may, will continue to be an issue as long as there's this vice grip from many universities yeah. over it. Okay. <coughs> We've got plenty of questions coming in. Oh, really? Um, so, uh, uh, stand by. plenty of answers. Yeah. Stand by, <laughs> and uh, the first one will be a tricky question because it's from Mark uh, Dahl, oh, right. uh, yes. from the Association of Employment and Learning uh, Providers. A known tricky person, um, yes. Know. So, I'll, I'll give you a bit of time to think about this, but the question is, do you not worry that since incorporation and the move from polytechnics into the university sector over 25 years, that FE has missed the opportunity to establish themselves as leaders of technical higher education, especially level four and five. Now the universities are seriously populating this space, brackets again, and along with higher apprenticeships, there will be no space for colleges. Yeah, I, I, I don't think that's right. I think, yeah, I think Mark's right that some universities are going to drill down, if you like, in, into work that for the last 10 years they've not considered uh, for them. Mm. Um, I think that will have some impact on the way colleges operate, but I do think that colleges and training providers are much more flexible in a better shape to talk the sort of the language that industry and business wants mm. rather than try to impose what we think is right for them. So that's that open dialogue and that, that involvement of employers. Mm. And to do that, we probably need, well, we certainly need to have much more control over what we validate and how we assess in the workplace and elsewhere. So I, I do think we, we've still got that 10%, that 160,000 yeah. or so students. So I don't think it's, it's quite all lost in that way. And I think we have been subject to external changes which haven't really helped us. And I'd say the, the, the decline in part-time has been that. I think the behaviour of some institutions, some universities, hasn't been helpful in this because they're mm. trying to, to cut down on the validations that they'll give, either by level or by institution or by subject. So I do think that uh, that monopoly position hasn't been helpful. But I do also think you know, there, are, there are now dozens of colleges offering higher education. Uh, there are certainly some, the Mixed Economy College group members in particular, who have significant amounts of higher education, which defines more than 500 FTE. So I don't think, I wouldn't agree totally with what Mark says, I do think we've got a good foundation now to enter this new market of higher degree apprenticeships, yeah. but with these new partnerships, new collaborations. Yeah. I, um, I have something of a sort of view in relation to uh, particularly what happened during the 1990s and the kind of marketization yeah. of mm. uh, further education, that, that further education colleges um, primarily pursued full-time students because that's where the funding was and that's where yeah. the, yeah. the rewards yeah. were, um, hence the 
uh, collapsing part-time study uh, in Effie, yeah. Um, yeah. Uh, and universities did something very similar in terms of full-time honours degrees. Um, so I very much kind of understand what you're saying about um, FE colleges and learning providers being uh, more respect, flexible and responsive uh, to the local market yeah. and that there may be opportunities uh, in that, particularly where there are higher education cold spots and there are many of them uh, around the place. Do you agree with that? Yeah, I think well, we've got to cold spots in a minute. I think the other thing that colleges are, are uh, you know, even the largest provider of HE and FE is still essentially an FE college yeah. with FE provision at its heart and core. And yeah, I guess we have built up full-time provision, partly because for a lot of young people the job opportunities weren't out there. And we've seen yeah. that decline in 16 to 18 apprenticeships continue, which I think it needs to be addressed as well. It's a separate issue. But what we have seen is because of changes in government policy, not the decimation, but also the, almost the extermination of community and adult education. Yeah. And that really is a policy decision. And I think that really has affected not just college budgets, although as a principal they're dear to my heart, obviously, but it's affected the number of people that we can bring into college. As yeah. I said before, it's that first step that's really important. It's giving them the confidence that they can come in, the confidence they maybe acquire you know, basic literacy and numeracy skills, yeah. and then move on. And every yeah. college, I think, that offers HE, every college even that doesn't, will have stories of people who come in really with very little, having considered themselves educational failures for years, yeah. who come in, they take that first step, and then the next, and the next, and before you know it, they've got a degree. So I do think we, we need to, to think of ways of, of getting back to that position where we can offer really very attractive and accessible ways into education, then we can then signpost those individuals to the right sort of progression. And it won't be HE for everybody, it may be something different, uh, but that should be there as an opportunity. And there, there are signs that, 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 that policymakers are aware of this and signs that they're actually, if not going to do something about it in the short term, are trying to sort of scope the territory to see what needs to be done. Yeah. And that's the perfect answer to the question I haven't asked you yet. Well, I um, yeah. because this, I've is this is turning into a two Ronnie scale. <laughs> <isn't it? laughs> so we've got a great question from Lisa Jo Guyer from Walsall College, and she says, could FE be a leader in bringing more adults into higher education from communities who would not consider HE and give them a life map to professional status supporting social mobility? Yeah, well, I think, as they say in Parliament, I'd refer you to my previous answer. Yeah, but, uh, I think, I think, but actually, I think just to take that on a bit further, I think, again, the, the approach to funding for HE, once they get to that point, and it's a big journey to get there, doesn't help yeah. because um, we've got this 25% intensity rule in there. So you can't just bring someone and say, well, just do this module. You know, the, yeah. the, the, I was involved in a project that was actually um, led by the Office of Fair Access, because I think Offer, which now, of course, is part of OFS, understood this issue. And what we were trying to do was look at how universities in particular access or offer access to adults who really have been out of the system for a long time. So the OU has got some units in numeracy because that can, if you want to go into a STEM subject, Amazing. numeracy can be yeah. a real problem, which are really diagnostic in nature. Yeah. So they're not meant to be barriers, they're not meant to be tests, they're meant to be experiential and exploratory. So you can actually just put your toe in the water yeah. uh, and just see what it's like. And as I say, it's not for everybody, but there's a surprising number of people out there who really could benefit who haven't. And yeah. so what we need to do is make sure that that provision is there that it's funded appropriately, because I suspect they're not going to fund it themselves, and that they're actually able to then see the way forward. And that raises the issue about how adults access advice and guidance. Yeah. Because too often, I think, in the world of, well, I've got to say, colleges, schools, and universities, and everybody else, we, 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 we do a lot of marketing. We probably need to do a bit more informing and a bit more advising and guiding to make sure people are on the right course or the course yeah. that's right for them. Yeah. And that, I think, is a big challenge because virtually all of those services have disappeared. Yeah. So I do think we have that role. I think we're better able to do it than, than many other institutions. And I, I, I guess I should say, I'm not trying to condemn all universities. Some universities do a good job of this and, and, yeah. and bring people in. But a lot of universities have decided it's not our mission, it's not what we want to do. That, to me, creates a gap in the market that colleges could actually mm -hmm. fill. Not just for commercial reasons, but because there are all those people out there that will need to bring in to much more economically productive roles. Yeah. Absolutely. I found somebody that agrees with you. Really? Um, yeah. Hello, Mum. Yes. Uh, so, Hilly Prendergast <laughs> of uh, Wiltshire College. 
right. totally agree with you uh, and what you've said. The example of teaching assistants who stay as teaching assistants after their FD or full degree. In the destination data, this is not considered a graduate destination. That's right. The impact that highly trained TAs have on children is massive, but this does not seem to be valued in the data. Hmm. It's a technical point I don't really understand. Well, I think that's right. Under, under the measures for the Teaching Excellence Framework, they look at things like destination. And again, uh, they classify jobs, which to me is, is crazy, yeah. really, yeah. because you could have somebody who, a part-time student, who actually is put on a course by their employer, but that's done to prepare them for the next step. The employer yeah. determines when they're ready for that, if yeah. they don't go and work somewhere else. So I do think that, that, that it's a really blunt instrument. Uh, not everybody studies because they're going to get a higher income from it. They right. study to get the job that they want. So again, in the caring professions, I think you, you know, it is being argued all the time, teaching, nursing, social work, you don't do it for the money. You actually do it for the, for the reward and the contribution that you make. And I think we need to recognise that. And I think in terms of persuading decision makers about this, it's about providing that evidence. Yeah. It's about saying it's more than just social mobility, it's more than just high income. It's Absolutely. more than just the number of high court judges yeah. who went to you know, maintain schools. Yeah, absolutely. Um, a question come in from James Rhodes of Hadlow College, um, and it goes back to something we were talking about earlier, actually, in terms of um, creating a HE environment. Yeah. Um, because James asks, alongside the courses offered, whoops, I've switched, managed to switch this off, sorry. <laughs> um, well, what he was asking about, uh, I remember the question, uh, here we are, yeah. uh, was about how you enhance the wider student experience in terms of enrichment, sport, health, well-being, yeah. learner involvement uh, that help to develop the attributes that graduates yeah. have, which is more than a, just about their study. Yeah, I think a couple of things there. And again, I differentiate between full and part-time students. Um, a lot of colleges, my own uh, until a few years ago, we tended to consider uh, high-level students as part of a vocational area, which they are. Yeah. But it then occurred to us, of course, that they only meet people from that vocational area studying at high level. When some of them had also been our level two, level three students and progressed to HE at the college, that differentiation of experience and meeting different people just wasn't there. So now we're looking across the college. So things like induction, we try and do across the college, on a cross-college basis, yeah. so they meet other HE students. The same with staff as well, actually, because staff teaching HE and FE can sometimes feel they're in a bit of, a, a bit of isolation, a bit of a silo. Mm -hmm. So we try to teach across because quality mechanisms and quality assurance processes are across rather than down, if yeah. you see what I mean. Um, I'll try and explain that using my hands before, again. But <laughs> I think also with um, part-time students, I think I said before, that their expectations and the experience they want are very different. And I think with college students, people choose to study at college. So they're choosing a different approach to HE because they've got other stuff in their lives. Mature students particularly, part-time students in employment, but also some young people who don't want that student lifestyle that universities project. Right. That they want to remain in their communities, they want to maintain maybe part-time employment, they want to maintain friendship circles of people who may not go off to university, and, and they want to stay in the region or the area of the city in which they were brought up. There's nothing wrong with that. And therefore, I think we're offering a different approach, a different experience that's going to be the same in terms of academic quality, but not the same in terms of meeting student expectations, because the expectations are yeah. different. If you forget the students, then you may as well forget the whole thing. It's about them, and it's about making sure that they get what they want from that experience in college. Do you have graduations and an alumni? We have graduations, yeah. In fact, we've got um, four graduation ceremonies in about uh, a month's time. Right. So yes, we do. And, um, but it's very clear, and I hope I make it clear, I'm sure colleagues in the college make it clear, that's not the high point of, of achievement in the college. No. What we're looking is at distance travel. So yeah. we also have celebration events for students with learning difficulties yeah, and for absolutely. every vocational area as well. Yeah. And in fact, you know, some of the distance travelled, some of the journeys of the people who don't get to degree level are far longer and greater than people who get degrees. Yeah. So you know, I'm not demeaning the people who get degrees, but, uh, and we celebrate them in a, in a traditional way, but I do think we also need to recognise that for some of them, the journey's been a very long one. Yeah. Um, and that they start off needing very basic educational inputs and after you know five, six, seven, eight years, however long it takes, we do market and we celebrate it. But I do think that's not, that's not what it's about. Mm -hmm. What it's about is the other measure that, that we talked about, um, social mobility and income. 
I think the other measure to me is destination yeah. and looking at do the students when they come in get the sort of job they wanted, the teaching assistant, d does it do the trick for them? And that to me is the key to value for money as well. Sure. I thought we were going to get away without mentioning Brexit. All right, um, yeah. But I have a question from uh, Boris Johnson. No, it's not Boris Johnson. <laughs> um, it's not Theresa May, is it? No. Uh, <laughs> I've actually managed to, uh, to, to move off it, but I'll, I'll, come back to, I'll come back to that in a minute because okay. I seem to have uh, lost it from the... Uh, apologies to whoever sent that in. So I, uh, another question here from Alison Milner at South Devon College. What do you think the impact for teaching staff will be on their identity when they are teaching HE in FE? It, it can be very difficult, I think, for teachers because the, there's a, a relatively small proportion of HE and FE teachers who are HE specialists and only teach HE. We have some of those at, yeah. at New College. I think more the case are people who teach both FE and HE. That's got some real advantage because it actually means that the teacher can see different perspectives on the subject yeah. and, and different levels of the subject. It means the students can actually see somebody who might, if they're at level two or level three, somebody who might teach them at level four and level five and thus inspire them to do that. Yeah. But I think it also, the challenge for the teacher is, if, because FE is a hard environment to teach in, uh, I think you can be teaching you know, a level two, level three class in one hour, then an hour later could be teaching yeah. a foundation degree or an HN group. Yeah. And making that switch is actually very difficult. I think we, mm. we underestimate the effort that our teachers put into that. Mm. I think it's important also though to re recognise that the staff development needs for HE and FE are different. Yeah. And then in colleges I think you need to, to sort of get those people together and look at the cross-college aspects of staff development. I know a lot of college staff um, under the Higher Education Academy were applying for fellowships and membership. Now under Advance HE the same thing will happen. Yeah. So I do think that's a, a debate to be had. But it is a challenge. I think a lot of my colleagues who teach both HE and FE find it, um, it's what they want to do and they, they, they find it rewarding professionally and in all sorts of other ways, but it is hard and I think we need to, to recognise that and it isn't one size fits all. So yeah. we need to make sure our staff development systems, our qualification systems, our staff development programmes are actually designed to recognise that HE is different and requires different approaches. Yeah. If you don't do that, then ultimately the students will tell you because they don't feel they're getting that HE in, yeah. in their course. So is there a role for the Education and Training Foundation in providing a better or more responsive support yeah, for HE um, teachers? I think there is. I think you know, HE and FE has been a bit of an orphan actually in the past because yeah. we've fallen between two stools. So uh, we've tended to think in terms of sectors which have these great gulfs between them. Whereas I'd much rather think of a system that's got lots of links and overlaps. Yeah. You know, I think some of the issues and some of the criticisms of universities would be could be addressed a bit better if staff in universities, teachers in universities, understood what was happening in schools and colleges, yeah. which I don't think they do largely. So, or that's probably unfair, but I don't think it's an easy mechanism for them to do it. So the ETF, yes, they, they can do a number of things. They, they, can, they can fund some of it, that would be great. <laughs> um, so I'll, I'll leave my address later for <laughs> David Russell at ETF. Uh, but also I think they can do, they can pick up the, 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 the baton that, that actually Fettel lays down about thinking about this about how do we actually get the structure in place. We just don't put it in the too difficult box. Yeah. So I do think ETF have got a challenge there. Um, it certainly shouldn't be allowed to fall between two s stools. Yeah. There are dozens of colleges and thousands of students who need that support. Sure. And probably thousands of teachers as well. So we need to really pick this up and, and, and deal with it as, not as a sector, but as parts of, um, you know, almost cogs within a system. Yeah. We're leaping around. So okay. I've, I've found my Boris Johnson question. Excellent. It's right. actually Catherine Griffiths from Oldham College. Oldham, yes, uh, apologies, <laughs> uh, Catherine, for losing it earlier. Uh, and the question is, how do you think that FE, uh, brackets in partnership with HE, can respond to some of the possible implications that Brexit may have on skills in the workforce? Okay, well, you, you can either be positive or negative about this, and I think it's better to be positive in many ways. I mean, if one of the consequences of Brexit is that we were, were less able to, to bring skilled workers, already skilled workers, into the country, then that to me raises an assumption, presumption, that we need to train them ourselves yeah. and educate them ourselves. So that's a great opportunity. 
you know, there are thousands of people out there, thousands of jobs out there, whether one agrees with it or not from a you know, personal political perspective. Uh, there are lots of jobs out there in nursing, in the care sector, but everywhere actually, which actually at the moment are occupied by people who may have more difficulty in the future getting in to the country. I think the visa yeah. system already causes lots of issues and problems to arise. So yeah, being positive about that, that's a great opportunity for college and everybody else actually to, 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 to help to fill that skills gap. Yeah. And given that we've already got that higher technical skills gap anyway, mm. with the demographic change that's occurring across most parts of the UK, I'm pretty positive that colleges and others can respond. And you talked about collaboration competition earlier. I, I suspect the demand there is going to be so great, it's going to require mm. collaboration. Mm. Competition probably won't enter into or needn't enter into it too much because there'll be plenty there for everybody. Mm. It's a major challenge for the education and trading sector. Do you think that um, colleges and providers that do enter the HE market will also think about international students? Yeah, international, and again, Mixed Economy has done some work on this. In, right. We mentioned the decline in part-time students. There's been uh, an equally large, probably larger decline in, part, in uh, international students studying HE in colleges. Yeah. We think, according to the best information we can get, and, and data is difficult to get, and it's always out of date by the time you've got it, but there may now be less than a 1,000 uh, international mm. students studying HE in colleges, and they tend to be grouped around specialist provision, so in maritime engineering, yeah. in land-based studies. So it's not a feature of HE and FE to have lots of international students there. Yeah. And that is something that could be addressed, but there are all sorts of issues around visas, issues around three-year courses being easier to, to promote and get visas for, which I think need to be addressed. But uh, you know, whilst the monograph has, has been kindly supported by FETL, there will be something else coming out quite shortly okay. around international students in, in HE and FE. Yeah. Yeah, there'll be a challenge there, I guess, in terms of, is it a tier four license or? Uh, yeah, all of that is real. It can be a real problem. Yeah. And um, some of the most successful programs are actually, you know, almost government to government or sponsored by companies. I think individuals wishing to study HE and FE, you know, if we have an issue about awareness of HE and FE and the fact that you can study HE and FE college for UK based students, for English students, we're talking about the English system here, the Scots do it different and better in many respects, um, then I think you know, the, the problem with, the, with international students is even greater. Yeah. So I do think well, that's a big challenge. Um, some colleges will, uh, will uh, have a go at it and be successful, but I think many more will look at their regional and local markets because that's traditionally what colleges and training providers are there to serve. Yeah. Okay. Uh, a question from Steve Taylor from WCG. Um, it's quite a, a slightly longer question, so I'll right. give you a bit of time oh, to, to, to think about it. So the question is, do you feel College HE is aligned closely with the new mission set out by the Office for Students relating to value for money, fair access, equality of experience, etc. Is this a significant change that has actually come through the traditional work done by College HE, where student experience, access and flexibility is central? Yeah, I, I don't think we should be worried by that at all. And um, if the Office for Students is um, genuine about that, which I believe it is, yeah. uh, then I think the college is in a great position because we're not elitist, we're not selective. No. We need to work with integrity to make sure people are on courses that they can succeed on. But I do actually think that we've got a great opportunity there uh, to, to build on the experience we have. So if you look mm. at the Hefke analysis of widening participation, colleges there consistently have done better in the proportion of WP students that come into our institutions. Yeah. That shouldn't be a surprise. Yeah. Um, but it's something that we do, and we know we do it well. Mm -hmm. So we need to build on that. So mm -hmm. I think, yeah, the Office for Students are going to be looking for value for money. Students have always looked for value for money. I think the challenge for us as colleges that I guess a lot of universities don't see is employers also look for value for money. Mm -hmm. And the debates that we're having now around higher degree apprenticeship and the, the use of the levy I think, as I said before, some employers are looking to see, well, how can we maximise the return on that? Because it's our money. Mm. And, and we want to make sure we get the best trained, best educated staff we can. Mm. So I think you've got a, a different debate there as well around value for money. Mm. And for us, it's always difficult. I guess for full-time students, it's, it's relatively straightforward. It's keeping them satisfied, happy, challenged and stretched, and making sure they feel it's worthwhile. Mm. I think for part-time students who are in employment, you've also got to satisfy the employer's need as well, mm. which is a whole different agenda. And, and there's got to be some compromise in the middle between 
you know, the academic standards that we're always there to, uh, to, to apply and enforce, and what the employer wants and what they understand by highly skilled individuals. Sure. And of course, there are two different inspectorates for HE yeah. and uh, FE. If I was with a sort of Ofsted hat on or, or an FE hat on, do you think there's a danger that colleges will take their eye off the ball if they're pursuing higher education and yeah. um, you know, provision which may not be considered to be central to their mission? I think mission drift is really very dangerous and, and it's, a, it's a massive risk if you're not careful because yeah. for a lot of staff, a lot of managers, leaders, governors, HE can be you know, superficially attractive. You mentioned graduation ceremonies and the dressing sure. up that goes along with that. Mm. That can be a sort of very symbolic thing. But I do think, as I said before as well, every college offering HE is essentially an FE institution. And if you lose sight of that, then you do so at your peril. Yeah. But I think there are great advantages in that because you can provide progression opportunities from level three FE exactly. that wouldn't exist in the university yeah. system because they don't recognise the subjects uh, yeah. as having that sort of academic value. So there's great scope there. Um, and I think also you, know, you, you can find different students that way as well. So I'm pretty confident that, that's, okay. that there's a role there for us. Good. Okay. I have a final question. Um, and it actually goes to um, uh, Ricky McManamy, who's the oh. managing director of Rules Restaurant, but not only that, he's the chair of Fettel. So oh, well. it seems pr quite appropriate that uh, he be uh, able to ask this question. And it is um, uh, along a theme that's been through the discussion we've had, which is why are learning outputs misaligned with the needs of industry after years of employers being in the driving seat, going back to Leach and Foster, yeah. etc.? Uh, well, I suspect the real answer is employers haven't been in the driving seat over that period. Uh, there's been a lot of committees, a lot of commissions. I think the way it happens for me is at that point of delivery. Yep. It's talking to your local employers about what yep. they want to see, having that dialogue between what's expected of in education institutions in terms of standards and quality. And I would say that the, the last thing we want is for college-based HE to be seen in any way as inferior or second class. Yeah. That, that, that can't be allowed to happen and therefore I think in colleges we, we apply those standards pretty rigorously and the QEA reports will, will say that. But I do think that we've got the opportunity as smaller institutions, as, as less cumbersome institutions to have that proper dialogue. I think if colleges can get things like awarding powers of their own then you can sit down with an employer and you can broker new types of higher education where assessment might take place in the workplace. Yeah. And I don't just mean workplace diaries or projects, but really embedding what we do in the workplace. That requires us to take risks. It requires the employer to take risks. Yeah. It requires us to sit down and talk to them uh, on, from a position of equality. Yeah. So I don't think we have done that well enough. Uh, and therefore, we probably shouldn't be surprised as that, that lack of, of match. I do think we as colleges and training providers as well are in a much better position to understand what employers want at that higher technical skill level. Yeah. as opposed to you know, much higher levels of PhDs or whatever it is. And I think we're, we're beginning to talk the same language, and that to me is the start yeah. point. John, I really enjoyed the conversation, and I hope the, uh, the viewers have as well. Um, I just wanted to t t say something about what I've taken from uh, the mm -hmm. conversation we've had, which is that um, it strikes me that we're not talking about a adversarial situation where... Uh, universities compete with colleges and independent learning providers. We're actually talking about a national problem, mm -hmm. which is a shortage of people with high level skills um, and an opportunity to put on provision which is much more flexible and responsive to the needs of people in their communities and in their workplaces yep. uh, to give them the opportunity to uh, develop their expertise, uh, hopefully their earnings, and develop their career. Mm -hmm. So uh, I, I think it's very interesting when we, we, we talk about you know, collaboration against competition that actually uh, there's a big need out there and it's up to all the institutions that are involved in education and skills to, to try and meet that need. Yeah. Um, would you like to say anything as a sort of summing up or uh, a final uh, statement in relation <laughs> to uh, this? Uh, yeah, I think, I mean, I hope people will read the monograph. Um, 
it's available, you know, it's free even. I mean, I'm not going to retire yeah. on the proceeds, which is a great sadness yeah. to me. Um, but I do also think that um, it's meant to, to make people think. And again, as, as we said all the time, that's the purpose of FET, it's the purpose of the monograph. We'll come up with different solutions. What I would say, we've talked about collaboration competition. I think within HE and FE, I do feel that the need and the appetite to collaborate more. Yeah. So whereas as colleges, we often see ourselves in competition with the college down the road, I think in HE, because not every college does it, because we do it differently, that's slightly different. And so I do feel uh, that there's a lot of exchange of information between colleges and yeah. increasingly with private training providers and, and learning providers. I think there are some universities who will play that game in that way as well. But when they don't, I think there's a lot of strength in colleges collaborating, working together. But in these yeah. new partnerships with private sector training providers, with employers, mm. we can do that if we're open-minded and we've got vision. And I think part of the problem around competition is universities not having that vision. John, I think you're getting a virtual round of applause, even uh, if I can't <laughs> hear it. But uh, I also take cash, Neil, so thank, thank you Thank you very, very much, much <laughs> indeed for uh, contributing to the webinar. And, and that brings us to the end of the webinar. Uh, it is being recorded, so uh, if you want to uh, go back to it uh, and listen to it again or share it with colleagues and uh, perhaps with your governors, then it's available on the FETL website. And I hope you will share it uh, and continue the discussion and the dialogue. Thank you very much.